Are you saying you were starring God of the City? Okay. <laughs> Lynn says you're praying, Laramie. Oh, I am. Check, check, one, two, check, check. Gratitude, gratitude. Four. Gratitude, four. Good morning, Cedar Grove. Good morning. I hope everybody's had a good week, and I, I pray that you're ready to worship the Lord with us this morning. And um, if you would, I'm going to ask you if you can bow our heads and pray together and just get in the right heart of worship this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your love. I want to thank you for the ability for us to look around and just see all your beautiful creation. And know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we serve a truly magnificent, all-knowing, wonderful God who has not left any detail untouched. And this morning, I know, Lord, that you'll touch our hearts and you'll bring us to a place where we can worship you in truth, we can worship you in love. I pray for our service today that you would bless Pastor Marty. Give him the words of wisdom that he needs to speak to the hearts that you've prepared. And I pray that you'll move in a mighty way this morning. We love and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us. We're going to sing God of this city.
Psalm 46, 1, 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, through the, though the earth gives way. The song's called Gratitude. All my words fall short. I've got none. sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands praise you again and again it's all that I
Sound great out there this morning. We got one more. This is a medley. Uh, we played this before. Just follow along the best you can. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One more time. He is Lord. All right, good morning. Good morning. 
Glad you're here to worship with us this morning at Cedar Grove. Uh, thank the ones uh, online looking in on us this morning. Uh, appreciate the visitors being here with us this morning. Thank you. Um, the ones to be in prayer for, uh, Mike and Donna, Roger and Merle, Al and Linda, Daron, Brenda, Bill, Tom, Mike, the Espinosa family, Frankie, Alan, and the ones uh, our church family and families will be traveling this week or this weekend for uh, safe traveling mercies for them. Um, Easter egg hunt this coming Saturday um, at 1 here on the grounds. Um, do we, I think we have enough candy now, though, don't we? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, our uh, Easter sunrise service will be in uh, two weeks. I think we're going to start it at uh, 645. Um, that will be March the March 31st, last Sunday this month, for our Easter sunrise service. And uh, breakfast, breakfast will be served uh, right after the service that morning. It's going to be uh, rough to get up that early. <laughs> uh, uh, Tasha would like to meet with the... Uh, ones that would like to uh, be in the VBS uh, April the 7th, a meeting right after uh, the, the service that Sunday, uh, April the 7th. Um, I think she's going to provide the lunch that Sunday. Uh, she will have a uh, sign-up sheet up here for the ones that would like to participate in that this year. So I appreciate her doing that. Okay. Let's uh, please stand and uh, we'll sing our first hymn, uh, page 142, There is a Fountain, 142. Last. I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray. 
136, 136. This will be our offer to ring him. Now you may be seated. Deborah is going to sing for us today. Thank you, Deborah. Good morning. Good morning. Easter is 
my favorite time of the year because Jesus came as a baby, but he died as my Savior, and he lived. Uh, in Matthew 28, verse 7, it says, Go quickly and tell, he has risen from the dead. glad that Jesus lives within my heart today. How about you? Well, now, he, uh, that's weak. So any of y'all that don't have him in your heart, let me know, and we'll, we'll get that took care of, all right? I'm certainly glad we have a risen Savior. We don't, we don't worship some dead God or dead idea, but we, we serve a, a living God that's going to translate us one of these days into a whole new realm. Amen. Children going to children's church today, we're going to dismiss them. I want to pray. That's what I want to do before we do anything else. I want, I want to pray and, and uh, as they, they're leaving out, and then we'll, we'll get started. 
Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for the service that you've already been a part of. And God, I thank you for your people gathered here today to hear from you and to worship you. So, Father, I pray as we get ready to break the bread of life that they'll hear a word from you, that you'll speak to each and every one of our hearts, deal with that which needs to be dealt with. Father, I pray that those that are born again, that they'll leave this place closer to you. And Father, if there's somebody here today that does not know your son, Jesus Christ, may, day, may the day be the day that he comes and takes up his abode in the heart of that unbeliever. Lord, and change their destiny and change their desires. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... <clears throat> I'm going to start out by telling you about a, a person I've talked about before. When I was at my home church, it was an independent Baptist church, and one of the positions that they gave me, am I on back here, by the way? Yeah, okay. Um, one of the positions that they gave me was the missions director. And it, being as such, I had to keep up with the missionaries. That's one of the reasons I have such a, a love for missions and missionaries. I just I absolutely love them. One of our missionaries was a man by the name of Aaron McDermott. We called him Mr. McDermott. That's just what we referred to him as. Mr. McDermott had been a businessman, and he had worked, made a good living for himself and his wife. And as he got up into his 50s, his, uh, his company was kind of cutting back and one thing to another, and and so he's going to retire early. And so he told the Lord, he said, I want to give the rest of my life to you. Whatever it is, ever how much you give me, I want to find some mission work that I can do for you for the rest of my life. And so Mr. McDermott, he went and tried his hand at a lot of different things. And I don't remember all the things that he did, but he worked as a missionary doing a lot of different things. And finally, he went to a fair. Now, that's just never been, I like to go to the fair, but I want to eat cotton candy and stuff, you know. But he, he went to a fair to do ministry. Somebody invited him there. And he said, I wasn't really interested when I was invited, but I went. And he got hooked. And he started serving as, at the fairs, and his wife eventually came along with him this letter here uh, is dated november to december 2000 okay and so this was his his praise for the year he said for the year 2000 rosalie and i would like to report that we have been to 15 fairs in four states and have recorded 2721 souls who accepted the lord jesus as their savior So he was really prosperous in the last few years of his life, if you want to put it that way. A lot of us, we, we wait till the end of our life. We got, we got everything. We, we got to do all these other things before we get, get around to enjoying life, right? This past week, I was having a conversation with a, a couple of friends, and we were talking about some people that we knew they had got right to retirement age. They were, they were, they were retired. I mean, that, it's like they retired today and they passed away next week. You know what I'm saying? We all probably have those stories of people that we know who they worked their whole life and then they were ready to enjoy life and something happens. We, we all know them. We've all heard the saying that when we get to the point of death that none of us is going to say, I wish I'd have worked a little more overtime. I wish I'd have saved another hundred dollars. Those regrets that we have are the regrets that we can't get back with time. You know, I wish I'd have spent more time with my family. I wish I would have 
serve God better. I wish I'd have walked closer with God. We, we all, th- those are going to be the things that we regret. Okay, they really are. It's not going to be, I wish I had a bigger bank account. Because when we get to that point, we're going to understand that the bank account's not going to help us none. Okay, really it. Really it. This morning, I want to go into the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. Now, we're in the Passover season. And next week, if I was a normal pastor, I would be preaching on the triumphal entry. But I'm not normal. Okay. (laughs) So that won't be what we're preaching on next week, more than likely. Okay. But the event that we're going to read about this morning and discuss for the next 25 minutes or so is going to be an event that takes place after the triumphal entry. So this is the Passion Week of Jesus. This is the last week of his earthly ministry. As he's here, this event takes place. So if you would, I want to just read down through the story, chapter 14 of the Gospel of Mark, verse 1. And after two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. So I want you to notice that the chief priest and everybody, they're trying to get rid of Jesus now. They're trying to figure out how to do that. That's going to be important in a minute. But they said, not till the, till the end of the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. So they feared the people because if you know anything, and I know y'all do because y- y'all are all Bible scholars and study every day of your life. Amen. Okay. <laughs> and... But the Passover is a time when all Jewish men are supposed to go up to Jerusalem. And so all of these people, Jesus has been ministering now for three years. All of these people that he's been ministering to, they've seen his miracles. Maybe they've been affected by his, maybe it was one of them. Maybe it was a brother. Maybe it was a sister. Maybe it was their child. But they've been affected by his ministry for three years now. And they're all there at, at Jerusalem. At the, so they're saying, well, lest there be an uproar. We don't have an uproar. Let's do, it at, let's do it behind the scenes. Isn't that the way they like to do things? Uh, okay. So verse 3, pay attention to the details here. Verse 3, and being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he said at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spinnaker, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there was some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and had been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She had wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you will, you may do to, uh, good, do them good. Excuse me, but me, you have not always. She had done this; uh, she done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached through the whole world, this also that she had done shall be spoken. Uh, for a memorial of her. Verse 10, And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him, uh, betray him unto them. And when they had heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and, sought how, uh, and he sought how he, might, how he might conveniently betray him. So we see this this story here and this event that takes place it's actually recorded again in John's gospel and it's actually I believe also recorded in Matthew's gospel okay and so we have have this event and something similar I think in Luke's gospel I'm gonna get rid of this jacket and we have all these different details that we can pull 
from all of these things and learn more about what's going on. Who are our characters? Now, I'm going to try to help Laramie here, okay? And I'm going to try to help you in Bible study because that's part of my job as I preach, okay? Who are our characters in this event? That's always important to see who's there. So you have Simon the leper. It's his house. It's where? Where is it at? Bethany. What else is in Bethany? Who else is in Bethany? Yeah, and Lazarus, okay? Probably their next-door neighbor, I don't know. Down the street anyway. All right, so, so that's where it's at, and it's in Simon the leper's house, okay? We'll talk about that in a minute. Jesus is one of the characters. Mary, Martha, Lazarus, we know that through the Gospel of John. The 12 disciples are there, and we also know from the Gospel of John that the Jews came. Some of the Jews came because they wanted to see Lazarus. Okay, so we know all of these people are here in this home. All right. But as we know that. We need to kind of get down to the main characters, because that's what happens. We get in, we get our vision too big. The main characters are going to be Jesus, Mary, Judas. That's going to be the three people. But before we get there, I want to talk about Simon the leper just a minute. Now, I'm going to say something that you probably need to forget just as soon as I say it, okay? Because <laughs> there's absolutely no commentary nowhere. There's no Bible scholar nowhere. There's no, 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 nobody that I know has ever said what I'm getting ready to say, okay? So if, if you hear it on the Internet next week, they stole it from me. <laughs> they owe me some money. Not really. This is a crazy idea. Look at it with me. Simon the leper. Simon is probably somebody that Jesus healed. And that's why he's having him there at his home. Okay? He's somebody that had been outcast from everybody because he's a leper. He can't, he can't interact with everybody else. Now, here comes the part that you better be careful with. Who's Judas's father? What's his name? Simon. John 6, verse 71. The first time you see Judas's name mentioned in, in John's gospel is in John chapter 6, verse 71, and it says, Judas... Iscariot, whose father is Simon. Could it be possible? Could it be possible? I'm not saying it is. Could it be possible that Simon the leper is Judas' father? And Judas sees Simon the leper get healed from Jesus, and that's why he starts following him. Could that be possible? I'm just saying, could it? I'm not saying it is, but it's something to think about. And if it is, what did Judas see in him that caused him to follow him? You see, that's, that's the thing. What did he cause? We got to go. I, 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 let's move along, okay? Verse 3, being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, one that Jesus healed more than likely, as he said at meat, there came a woman. This woman is Mary. We, we know that through John's gospel, okay? John chapter 12, verse 3, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spinnaker, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his uh, feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Okay, so we know it was Mary. Look at it now with me, verse 3. They said at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box. We know that that was, was Mary now. Ointment of spinnaker, very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. Now let's talk about that just a minute. Spinnaker, the word spinnaker means unadulterated, pure. 
So this, this ointment was 100% pure. So it wasn't nothing added to it. That's what made it so costly. And it's an alabaster box. It's not a box. It's a bottle. And the bottle's got a long neck on it. Now, some people say that she broke the seal, poured it on it. Some people even say she just poured some of it on it because it, it would just feel, the, it was so uh, uh, aromatic that it would just fill the room. There wouldn't be no reason for nobody to get angry at her if she just poured a little on it, right? I believe she took the, the bottle and she broke the neck of the bottle off where it can't be sealed again. And she poured it all on him. Now, John's gospel says she poured it on his feet. Mark's gospel says she poured it on him. I just believe she poured it all over him. Okay? And then she wiped it in with, with the glory of a woman. The, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe it is, that the glory of a woman is her hair. And she takes the glory of the woman and she wipes it on him. They want nothing left. Okay. She just come and became a fool for Jesus right there in front of everybody. And she poured it out. Right there in front of everybody. All these Jews, all the disciples, her sister, because we know Martha's serving. We know that from John's gospel as well. Martha just couldn't help but to serve. She's over at, at Simon's house. She's got to serve over there too. You know anybody like that? Denise? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, really. There's just some people that's like that. Man, they show up. Wherever they show up, they got to be in the middle of it. They got to be. That's Martha. But we know that's what's going on. She pours it out in front of everybody. Mary offers a sacrifice. We know further on down, it says, um, verse 5, for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. A pence being a day's wage. So for a year's wages, she poured it out. Now, I believe Mary and Martha and Lazarus was fairly wealthy. Okay? Let, let me just tell you. Now, you think about it. I had two grandkids come to my house and stay with us about two days. And they ate about a month's worth of food in two days. I went to the, we have a refrigerator out in our, in our garage. I went out to the garage and I opened the refrigerator up to get something to drink. They ain't nothing. They done drank everything, ate every cookie, ate, ate everything they can find. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> can you imagine having 12 tanners show up at your house and go and stay for an extended period of time? And you're going to feed and water them three times a day. Woo! I'm telling you, that boy going to grow into them feet one of these days. <laughs> so I believe they had money because that's where Jesus would stay and his disciples. That's 13 of them. 13 men. Staying there. They had to be wealthy. It's not a matter of how much you got. It's what you do with what you got. A lot of us say, oh, if I win the lottery, well, stay, quit playing the lottery. Okay. But if I win the lottery, I'm going, I'm going to give a million dollars to the church. I'm a, look, if you can't give out of the $400 you got, you ain't going to give out the million dollars. I'm just telling you. That's exactly right. So here Martha is, or Mary. She comes, and she's got something, and there's no telling how. She might have bought it just for this. I don't know. I have, It don't say whether she's been saving it or what. But she comes, 
She breaks, breaks the top off the bottle. The bottle is useless now. We can't even sell that at the yard sale. You know what I'm saying? Put a candle in there. No, no. Pours it on it. Pours them out. Precious. She give it all. In the contrast, as we see him, see her, in the contrast, look at verse 4. The Bible says, and there was some that kind of that kind of hides the identity of who it might be, don't it? And there was some that had indignation within themselves. So it was, a, it was something burning. How do, how do you know they had indignation? <laughs> you, you, just, just, the, just the reaction. We, we, have, we see people. You, you know what? You, you see them. I guarantee you, you make me mad on the road, you'll see it with me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we, we see the, the gestures from somebody. They, we, they had indignation on the inside of them. Matthew identifies them as the disciples. But John, he's bold. He says it was Judas. He was the originator of the criticism. I'm going to stop here and say something. We need to be real careful. I need to be real careful. I catch myself, and more and more I catch myself anymore. Being negative when I need to keep my mouth shut or either be positive. I, I'm just saying. We, we affect people like we wouldn't believe, man. It goes like our church is just, it's got the Spirit of God on it right now. It does. It has the Spirit of God. It is exciting to come in here every Sunday and worship with you because God is showing up and you see it in people's heart and you hear it in the music and you hear it in the prayers and God is doing something in the people in here now. And it takes nothing to throw a, a wet blanket over the whole thing and stop it. It just takes negativity. Here, here they are. Judas is, is the originator of it. Man, can you believe that waste? <laughs> we could have sold that. <laughs> we could have got 300 pence <laughs> and used that <laughs> in the bank account. Right? Oh, me. Ooh, man, they something a whole lot more important getting ready to happen. And it seemingly is only one person in the whole room understands it. And it's Mary. We'll get to that in a minute. But I'm telling you, it seems like Mary's the only one that's got a handle on what's going on. Everybody else is just confused. We, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? <laughs> Mommy, will you go tell Jesus to make me number one? I mean, that's, that's what's happening. It's exactly what's happening in this, in this time period. All right, let's go on. Ooh. It says, for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. This is... The, the, it, it was a waste of ointment. Let's go back to verse 4. And there was some that had indignation. It was, it was uh, Judas that started it within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment? It was a waste. It was a waste. Let me ask you a question. I've got a lot to say about all this, and we only got about five minutes to say it, but I've got a lot to say about it. I was in a class a couple of years ago, I was in a class, and my professor in that class was on the executive board of the school that I was taking the class from, and he just got back from a meeting, an executive meeting. And he said, now if it's a lie, he lied, but he said that they had 
I think it was either 15 or I think it was 17 million dollars in the bank. Let me ask you a question. Do you think now I believe how many of you believe Jesus could come back today? Okay. It's imminent. 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 In other words, there's nothing needs to happen. He'd come back today. Imminent. If you really believe and you're teaching that Jesus could come back today, do you think you need $17 million in the bank? Yeah, right. We see things as a, a waste. It's a waste. But what's really a waste is if we waste away and the money's still sitting there. Think about that. If the rapture takes place and there's $17 million in the Baptist account, yeah, the devil's going to use it for his school. Those professors that are still there, they'll get a big raise. <laughs> Oh, me. That was ugly, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Go ahead. All right. Verse 5. For it might have been sold for more than a year's wage and have been given to the poor. And they're murmuring against him. Judas... He justifies his indignation on philanthropy. Oh, I can't say it. On giving to the poor. How's that? But John identifies him as a thief. He said he, he didn't say this because he wanted to give it to the poor, but because he is, he is the man that had the bag. He's the one that held the money. John puts his finger on, on the issue. He said he did not care for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was therein. I got to hurry now. A lot of times, we need to be careful. Okay, we need to be real careful of how we spend money. We need to be careful of God's money. We need, to, we need to be in prayer about how to do things, what we ought to do, and all that kind of stuff. Would you agree with me? Amen. Okay. But a lot of times where the pushback gets, comes is somebody not even walking with God. Okay. Oh, we should have done this, and we should have done that. Everybody else said we should do this. Got one person, no, no. Now, one person could be right and the rest could be wrong, okay? But they can't all be right. Right, right, okay. Look with me now, verse 6. Jesus said to her, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She had wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, you may do to them good. But, you, but me, you don't always have. She had done what she had done. She come beforehand to anoint my body for the burying. How did Mary know? I'm going to tell you. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 and following. Now it came to pass as they went and entered into a certain village and there was a certain woman named Martha received them into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She was listening to what Jesus was saying. Everybody else was worried about jockeying for position. And she was listening to what Jesus is saying. Folks, we've got to know the Word of God. We've got to know the Word of God. We've got to put it, I keep telling y'all that, we've got to put it in our heart. It's got to be what we feast on daily. Jesus said we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of Scripture, out of the Father's mouth. Okay? Man, she knew because of what, what she'd been listening to. 
Look at verse 9. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also shall, uh, she had done shall be spoken of for a memorial to her. We don't have time to go into it. Judas is, he's going to go and he's going to approach these guys that was talking about how can we crucify this man? They would have never, they would have never ever went and approached one of the 12 and said, hey, $30. And it wasn't $30, 120 days wages is what you got. Tell you what, I'll give you about four months work. If you just give him to me. But here's one of the 12 goes to them. And from that moment on, he's trying to portray, looking for an occasion. It's funny, you know what the word Judas means? Praise. And that name has become a byword. The Judas goat that leads the sheep into the slaughter. A Judas is somebody that will betray you. And his name is supposed to be praise. You see, he's become a byword. And yet she, Mary, is praised as a memorial for what she done. She poured out that which was precious to him. Now I'm going to give you something real quick and we're done. We're done. I read this in my devotions this week. 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 14, the lady that came to David to convince him to go after Absalom, this is what she said when she had been discovered by him. For we must need die and are as water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again, neither does God respect any person. Our life is like water spilled on the ground. Our life is like this ointment that Mary poured out on her Savior. You can't take it back up again. The ointment that, that he, she poured out actually would dissipate real quick. It's like um, lacquer thinner. When it hits, it don't take but a minute, and it's completely out into the air. There's no more liquid there. Our life is like that. It's a vapor. We pour it out. What are you pouring your life out for, folks? What are you pouring your life into? We all got to work. Oh, me? Yeah. That's, that's one of the things. We have to work and make a living. Unless you're just independently wealthy. And if you are, we owe some money on the front of the building, like a check this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. We all got to work, right? But what do you do with the rest of your life? What are you doing with the rest of your life? Are you hoarding it up? Are you pouring it out? Mary breaks the alabaster. It's useless. She pours it out. She uses her glory to wipe it in. For memorial for her Savior, the one who done everything for her and the one who was going to pay her sin debt. And if you're saved today, he paid your sin debt. What are you pouring your life onto, man? Is it a sweet fragrance that fills the room? That can't be, it can't be put back in the box. Or are we putting it in the bank waiting for tomorrow? Not all of us can be Mr. McDermott. Not all of us will be guaranteed that we'll be able to retire early and then be able to actually serve God for the rest of his life. 
he went on to be with the Lord now. But up to his dying days, he served God as a missionary. It's time today to start. It's time to break open the alabaster box and pour it out. What is it that you're holding back from God? What is it you're holding back that's precious? That's holding you back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we want to thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the example of Mary. What a servant. What a sold-out soul. She didn't care who talked about her while she wasn't serving. She didn't care who talked about her when she was serving. She just poured her heart out to you. Father, help us to be more like Mary. Lord, if there's anybody here that's got it bottled up, and they're hanging on to it for a special occasion. Lord, I pray that day will be the day they'll break open that bottle and pour it out because they may not have another opportunity. It may be somebody today that needs it. Father, work in our hearts. Finger where it needs to be fingered at. Lord, if there's somebody here that's like Judas, they're lost. They hear the gospel, but they're lost. I pray that today would be the day of salvation for that soul. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You come as God leads you this morning. This is Pastor Marty Granger here at Cedar Grove, and we just want to thank you for tuning in with us this Sunday uh, and spending your Sunday morning worshiping with us here. It means so very much to us as we see people tune in week after week. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Today, as we went through the service, as you worshiped with us, if you feel like God's dealing with your heart on the fact that you're not saved and you need to make a decision uh, for him, we'd love to help you in that process. It's a simple process. You just got to agree with God. And that is that you're a sinner and you're in need of a Savior. If you'll call upon Him, He will save you. The Holy Spirit's dealt with your heart and you're a Christian and you need to make some decisions. We'd encourage you to do that as well. Now, again, we've enjoyed you being with us this Sunday and we look forward to worshiping with you again at the midweek and next Sunday as well. In the meantime, if you need to contact us, that information will be made available. May God richly bless you and we look forward to seeing you at the next appointed time.